So you're all here tonight to hear Dr. Brian Miley speak about his uh, book, Healthy Society, and we're very excited to have him here at the Regina Public Library to talk about this book as I really feel, and I know that the library feels, that we're an integral stakeholder in this community and literacy is linked directly to health and that is what we're directly an advocate for. So thank you for coming and we're so happy to have you here. We have Jens Peterson and he's going to be doing the introduction of Ryan Miley. Jens is a lawyer in Regina and he has been twice the candidate for the MLA in Regina South and a candidate for the leader of the NDP in 2009. All right. And Dave Mitchell is going to be right over there. Dave is going to be sitting down with Brian up here to conduct a little interview Q&A about this fabulous book. And Dave Mitchell is a freelance journalist and the editor, an editor, editor, and former editor of the Briar Patch. He recently released a book of his own called Beautiful Trouble, A Toolbox for the Revolution. So first up here is Jens. Thank you. It's my honor tonight to, to introduce Dr. Ryan Miley. I first met, first met Ryan in the leadership race for the NDP in which we were competitors. He consistently articulated a thoughtful, uh, principled, and a practical um, uh, response when, uh, when presented with issues. And he revealed a depth that, uh, that we rarely see in political representatives. His personality and his approach are obviously much different than what we are used to seeing from politicians. Uh, as mentioned, he currently works at the West Side Community Clinic in Saskatoon. His contributions include helping set up SWITCH, which stands for Student Wellness Initiative Toward Community Health. Now that is a student-run clinic which brings together students from dif different health disciplines to serve the residents of uh, Saskatoon's inner city. He also runs the College of Medicine's program, Making the Links. It gives to medical students the opportunity to work in northern Saskatchewan, at Switch, and also in rural Mozambique, so that students gain first-hand knowledge of the social factors which challenge health. He is also the vice chair of the National Advocacy Organization, Canadian Doctors for Medicare. Now tonight we're all here to hear about his first book, A Healthy Society, how a focus on health can revive Canadian democracy. While the title and the cover graphics are probably not going to get it to the New York Times bestseller list, um, it does deliver exactly what it pledges to. It provides insight into how to revive Canadian democracy. I've commented before that to speak of the NDP as having left and right uh, divisions is really a misnomer. Really, the division in the party is between those who view uh, social democratic policies as the most important and those who view winning elections as the most important. One side emphasizes being practical and compromising policies. One side emphasizes being more principled. The reason I mention this distinction is because while Dr. Miley has been uh, described as being on the left of the party or on the more progressive side of the party, in his book he offers a completely practical approach to politics. His book describes the how of winning elections. His book describes the often preached but hard to practice concept of moving the center to us, not moving us to the center. His prescription is using health to frame our political discourse. Now while this book isn't likely to hit the bestseller list, it has received praise from a number of sources. The Honorable Lauren Calvert, former Premier of Saskatchewan, said, this work makes an important contribution to progressive dialogue in Canada. And another former Premier, and Chair of the Royal Commission on the Future of Healthcare in Canada, the Honorable Roy Romano, states, a healthy society offers an inspiring means to fix what is broken in Canadian politics. I promised Ryan that I would keep this introduction less than 45 minutes, um, so uh, I won't read the comments, all the positive comments 
uh, from the other uh, other sources that are mentioned in the in the book or on the internet. My sources tell me that it is uh, possible that Ryan might be entering the NDP leadership race that's going on right now. Uh, now, while it remains to be seen whether uh, the praise for this book, um, whether it's from former premiers or from those of us in this room, uh, whether that will translate into support for Ryan in the leadership race, uh, if he does decide to enter, um, what is clear is that Ryan has earned a great deal of respect for his contribution to the discussion about how we want to shape our society and our communities. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Milo? Great, thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for the great introduction, Gans. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's really nice to, to be here uh, sharing, sharing the stage with you. Um, we've, we've been friends for a long time. Uh, and in the past few months, um, I had the honor of having you introduce me at, at my book launch in Saskatoon. And uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure here uh, putting you on the hot seat to talk about uh, your book. I, I hope you're going to give me at least as hard a time as I gave you. <laughs> I had less notice, so. <laughs> um, one of the main things you, you set out to do in your book um, is to get people to think differently about health and health care. Uh, I wonder if you could just talk briefly uh, about wh what you see as wrong with the way that health, the health care debate is framed currently. So it's interesting to start from a position of uh, talking about health care. Health care is obviously something that is very important to me. As a, as a family physician, it's the work that I do. Uh, it's something I was driven to be involved in uh, from, it's been a very long time that I've been interested in being involved in providing care. From originally from a point of view of, I really want to be able to participate in making folks better. Now, I want to be able to contribute in a way that uh, improves people's lives. And becoming a physician seemed like just such a practical and effective way of actually helping people. And in many ways, it really is, an, and it's an enjoyable thing to participate in. You really are able to have almost this, uh, it's, there's very quick gratification often in the role of physician for, for those who want to be uh, helping people. You see the results of your work right away. But before long, I think it occurs to most docs and uh, most people in the profession that lots of what we do is really just band-aids on a much bigger problem. We provide medications, we admit people to hospital, we, we can help people get a little bit better from something they're suffering from, and sometimes a lot better. But we do very little to actually affect what makes people ill in the first place. We do very little to actually impact health before people are sick. And so I think that's where a lot of the framing needs to be changed, is around moving from healthcare, where we really focus on what's happening after the fact, to moving upstream to try and deal with what keeps people healthy or, or what really makes people ill. And that's their real lives. That's where they live, where they work, where they go to school, how much money they make, what level of education they have, what kind of employment they have, whether they have good social supports, whether they have a safe place to stay, good food, and a, a clean and safe environment to live in. What I think the concept of health allows us to do is move, uh, move from health care, move from working on after the, after the fact, the most expensive and, and really least effective way of making people's lives better to moving upstream to affecting those social determinants of health. Uh, and that's really why I've put forward the idea of using health to be the main goal of our politics. Storytelling is a key, is a key part of, of how you convey the message in the book. Um, at the beginning of each chapter, you tell a story of a particular patient of yours and the insights, uh, the insights about the health of our society or lack thereof that you've gained through interactions with, with that person. Um, and well, I specifically wanted to ask you about the story of uh, Brad Picoquat, is that, uh, a young man you met early in your medical career. Can you say a bit about Brad's story and what it taught you? Brad Picoquat was a patient of mine, and 
everyone that I talk, talk about in the book was an actual patient of mine. Sometimes amalgamated, sometimes details changed, and always the name changed, except for Brad, because Brad actually told his story to the newspaper. Brad was very open about what happened to him. And Brad had had a very tough upbringing, grew up in a family with lots of substance abuse issues, lived in unsafe housing, had a dad who was involved in crime, and he and his mother and his brothers were regularly beaten up. And you can, you can clearly see how that's a, that's a family situation, that's a social situation where a lot of those social determinants of health we're talking about are missing. The determinants of health impact whether or not people are going to get sick. They also impact all kinds of other parts of our life, including behaviors. And for Brad, his behavior was to follow the example that he saw and get involved in crime. He ended up being one of the leaders of a, of a powerful gang in Saskatchewan called the Indian Posse. And he committed all kinds of very bad crimes with him and his brothers who were among the center of this gang and the rest of the members. And he eventually wound up in jail and out and in trouble again and back in jail again and out and in trouble again. And at one point, he, he met with a, a group called Straight Up. And this is a, a Catholic priest out of Saskatoon who works with gang members to try and get them out of the gangs. And Father Polyev has done really interesting work. And, and actually, a book came out this year about stories from Straight Up. Hopefully, they have it here at RPL. Um, through that, Brad decided to turn his life around. And he actually was doing really well. And he was going out with Straight Up and, and giving talks to at-risk youth and showing them that there was a better way. And he'd gotten married and had a family and had a job. And then he missed probation or some other minor infraction, not a new crime, but sort of administrative crime, and wound up back in jail. Just before he went to jail, uh, he'd been found to have a small growth. And that small growth could have easily been removed and, and was planned to be removed. He had a, he had a date with uh, the surgeon to, to get that growth removed. And he was in prison. And there was trouble at the prison. Uh, somebody, uh, there had been some, some difficulties with prisoners uh, making trouble. And so the guards, to punish the prisoners, uh, weren't letting them have privileges, privileges like going to the doctor for your surgery. <laughs> and so uh, Brad didn't get a surgeon. And by the time he got out and got back to see that, that surgeon again, it had spread much further, had spread into his lymph nodes, and was a systemic cancer. When I first met him, it was a few months after that, after he'd had to have a much worse and, and disfiguring surgery to take care of that cancer. And he was dealing with a lot of pain, uh, a lot of disfigurement from, from that surgery. And over the next four or five years, had a real struggle with his health and eventually did die. And Brad's story, you know, Brad's story is really just such a ridiculous tragedy, such, a, such an inappropriate thing to have happened. And it's also a very unique tragedy. It's Brad's story in and of, it, in and of itself, just for him. At the same time, I think it illustrates in a, in a graphic way some of the problems that exist within our justice system, some of the problems that exist within society as a whole, where people start out with so few chances. And even when they do manage to rise above uh, often the system is actually working against them succeeding, not helping them to succeed. Just, uh, you, you mentioned that the book often hinges on stories, and I think that's really important to focus on. Uh, as Jens pointed out, the title might seem a little bit dry, uh, and it might not necessarily grab you as, uh, this is going to be really readable. Um, but it actually reads a lot more accessibly and, and almost like a novel in many places, because I, I tell those stories. And I think that's important. Because even the, the introduction of the, of the faults in healthcare off the bat, it can be a little dry. Uh, if all I talk about are the concepts and the theories, it's like listening to Jens give me a 45 minute introduction. It's, it's very dull. Um, <laughs> and really, in order to make the leap from you know, this concept of the determinants of health, this isn't rocket science. It's actually pretty straightforward. And most people, when you actually get them to sit down and talk about it, 
the, what you see happening is heads nodding before very long. But to get there, there needs to be something to connect them. And I really think those stories, those real experiences of the lives of patients illustrating how the determinants of health affect individuals can be really helpful to talk about how we can look at societal change that can make their lives better. Early in your book, you write about the research of two British uh, epidemiologists, uh, Richard Wilkinson and uh, Kate Pickett, who uh, people may be familiar with uh, from their book, The Spirit Level. Uh, and Wilkinson and Pickett, uh, make, they make the argument that uh, unequal societies are also unhealthy societies, um, that everybody is worth off, worse off in an unequal society. Uh, can you talk a bit more about this research and um, the influence it had on on, on your book and the sort of what what you what you do with those ideas? The work in the spirit level and, and Wilkinson has other books, The Impact of Inequality, and there are other researchers who have certainly looked at this, but what they do is they investigate countries, compare country to country and also states within countries based on their level of inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor or concentration of, of wealth in certain uh, sectors of society. And what they discovered quite clearly was that health outcomes were worse in the countries that had worse, had higher levels of inequality and in the states as well. For example, in Missouri where there's very high levels of inequality versus some of the northwestern states, way, way worse health outcomes in Missouri. Now, that's not very surprising and it's something that makes intuitive sense. If you have more inequality, well, that's not likely meaning that you have a whole lot of really rich people and four or five poor people. You te it tends to be the other way around. Poor people tend to be sicker, and so you should have worse health outcomes in an aggregate. But what's interesting about their research is that it's not just in an aggregate. It also looked at a, social, at, at a health gradient at each level of social status. And what they discovered was that if you're a wealthy person in a more equal society, your health is better than if you're that, at that same level of wealth in a less equal society. So that's kind of a big headline. Uh, I think that really is an important piece of evidence to think about, especially here. Uh, we're in Saskatchewan where equality, equality is decreasing or inequality is growing at one of the fastest rates in the country. We're in Canada where inequality is growing faster than the United States where they have almost a religious attachment to inequality. Um, and uh, we're, we're really seeing a change in our society. Often uh, I, I think of the movement that is called conservatism in this country and think how completely revolutionary it really is, how much they are rotting a huge change in our society. And that change is really evidenced in those rates of inequality. I think it, so I think it's important for that reason, because it's pressing as a concern. But I also think it's important as a potential argument, as something that we can talk to people about. I imagine that the people who came here tonight, I probably don't need to twist your arm too, too hard to think that the determinants of health are important. Uh, if you came out to the public library uh, this evening to listen to me talk about a healthy society, uh, chances are there's some level of altruism that's driving you. Uh, especially you know, if it's uh, such a such a unappealing cover, you know, it, it wasn't grabbing you off the street. Uh, you had to know something about it and care. And I think a lot of people do, but I also think that that care gets uh, caught up in a in a fight with our perceived self-interest. And what this evidence allows us to do is talk about how, actually, if you if we work to increase equality, your life gets better. Even if you're middle class, even if you're upper middle class, no matter where you are in society, if we address the determinants of health, if we increase equality, your life will get better. And that really helps because it allows us to move the frame away from, this is something we need to do for the people over there, for the Brad Pequots from Yellow Quill of the world, to, now this is something we have to do for all of us. This is something we have to do for our own well-being. And that's really exciting to me because it's one of those times where you're not just talking about this is the right thing to do, but also that it's the smart thing to do, that it's actually going to improve our economy, our health outcomes, life for everyone in society. Doctors aren't generally known as activists. 
um, or as writers for that matter. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the activist doctors who have most influenced your thinking and your work. I, I had an experience uh, on June 18th of this year that I, I found really interesting. The federal government had cut uh, refugee health care and uh, had cut it quite drastically. And as a result, there was an uprising of doctors across the country as activists. And I got to be part of an event in Saskatoon where we took to the streets with docs and nurses and medical students and other people related to the health professions as well as new Canadians. And we marched up to the university hospital and had a big rally carrying signs, wearing our stethoscopes and our lab coats and our scrubs. And I was just so struck by you know, 50 years ago, doctors took to the streets in this province as well. Uh, but they took the, to the streets to protest universal health care, not to protest the fact that uh, vulnerable people were losing their health care. So that, that was exciting to me. And, and it said to me that maybe, actually, there's been a bit of a shift in your, in your introductory statement there around where, where doctors are politically and, and where they are as activists. Uh, in the front row are, are two medical students that I think very highly of who are activists in their own right. And I've seen since I started medical school, not that long ago, 2000, uh, when I was one of the weird outliers who wanted to work in the developing world, who wanted to work in the inner city, to now more than half of the students work at Switch, more than half of the students will spend some time in the developing world during their training. In terms of writers and, and their influence, uh, certainly there are a number of, of physician writers over the years who have influenced me. There's a, a really neat, uh, sort of forgotten book called Being Doctored uh, by Martin Shapiro that does a sociological analysis of the conservatizing force of going through medical school. And that really helped me view my own experience in training in a different way. And uh, probably caused me to be more of a radical than I might otherwise have been. Uh, you mentioned Gabor Mate. I, you actually pushed Gabor Mate on me halfway during the editing of this book. So uh, that's, uh, maybe you just wanted to talk about that a little bit more. But, and, and, you, and it really did have a big influence because Gabor Mate is a physician from Vancouver who works in the inner city there in East Hastings and works with uh, folks struggling with substance abuse addiction and really does so in, in bold and creative ways and writes about their stories in a way that really uh, helped me to think differently about how best to transmit the ideas in the book through patient stories. Paul Farmer, if you ever get a chance to read Pathologies of Power uh, or, see, or see the film Mountains Beyond Mountains, Paul Farmer is a, is a physician from Boston uh, who's an infectious disease specialist and he works in Haiti. And he actually, he hardly went to med school at all. He would, he would only come back for exams and he'd skip out to Haiti during med school and, and work in the mountains. And he writes uh, some incredible work uh, analyzing some of the, the effects of globalization, the effects of politics on health using Haiti and using patient stories as an example. He comes from a, a liberation theology point of view and talks a lot about the pragmatic solidarity and uh, is certainly one of the authors that, that I, I respect a great deal within the profession. I think, I mean, we have a pretty good idea of what makes uh, for a healthy individual. Um, but when, when you speak of a healthy society, like what, what makes for a healthy society, or to put it another way, um, what, is, what is the end goal you envision, or what's the sort of, what does the sort of politicizing process or the reframing process lead to? It can be sort of easy to jump to, here's the things we should do to have a healthier society. And I, I imagine, I mean, I certainly have some ideas of things we could do differently. And I know if we, and hopefully when we actually get to the discussion period, we'll hear some from, from the folks who came. Uh, but if we sit down together, we'll all come up with lots of things that are not being done well enough and that could be done better. And that's great. Uh, but I think um, sometimes, I think we might be missing a step when we all often jump to, here's what we need to change without talking about why we need to change it or how we need to change our thinking. And what I'm really proposing with this book is that what's, what's desperately needed in our society and in, in most Western countries is a shift in our goals. Uh, because right now, either we don't have any that are clearly articulated, 
we, we sort of jump from crisis to crisis, issue to issue, without really having a sense of a common direction, a common social project. Or we're chasing the almighty buck. And I'm, I'm not saying that we don't need a strong economy and that the economy isn't important. Income is the uppermost determinant of your health outcomes. It's really important. But it's important because of what it can achieve, not as a goal in and of itself. And what I'm really trying to put in front of us with this, with this discussion is we can change our goals and still focus on the things that are important, not lose track of the fact that we need a strong economy, that we need a stable education system, that we need employment, but putting them in their place of to have healthy, good lives. That that's really what we're trying to come, come up with through our collective decisions. And I, I often go back to the definition of health that the World Health Organization uses. We can, it's not just the absence of disease, which is often where we sort of park our idea of health is just not being sick. Health is full social, physical, and mental well-being, which to me sounds like a really good mission statement for our society as a whole. The other part of that, so that's a framing of re, redirecting our goals, but then there also needs to be a step of how do we come up with, in a, in a functional way, rather than just grabbing out of a hat the next policy idea, how do we come up with the policy ideas that will help us reach those goals? So first step is articulating. The second is having a democratic process where citizens can actually be involved. Um, spending so much time next to Jens uh, in 2009, I got to hear a lot of really cool ideas and was from him and from the people that we visited across the province and from the other people on, on the stage. And I wanted to see a way in which we could actually channel those into change. And I, I think the models that I've been digging into or looking at are around participatory democracy or on uh, finding ways to have more local involvement and more direct involvement for citizens to actually bring their ideas forward and more accountability through evidence-based policy. So where we're, we're collecting the goals and the ideas from the citizens. We're analyzing what's been done in other places and, and what we really can understand about the challenges we face and the opportunities in front of us. And then once we've implemented these ideas, a really important step that I think almost always gets left out of politics is analyzing honest, honestly whether or not it's been done right. Mostly what you hear is an opposition party saying what you did was terrible and a government saying what we did was fantastic. And it's, it's sometimes really hard to, <laughs> to know. And I w how wonderful would it be if we heard opposition parties saying what you did here was really good and there needs to change. What if you heard government saying this is what we had in mind to achieve. This was the health outcome. This was the policy outcome that we had in mind to achieve. And uh, it didn't work. And here's why we think it didn't work, and here's how we're going to change it. How much more interesting and engaging would politics be if instead of just spin, 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 we had that kind of honest engagement of the citizens in understanding and being a part of the decision-making process? Well, by all accounts, the, I mean, the, the interest in the book is, it seems, seems quite positive. And uh, talking to a mutual friend of ours in Saskatoon who runs a bookstore, this is the book's selling quite, quite well there. Um, you know, were you surprised by, by the response that it's garnered? And, like, what do, you, what do you take from that response? I was surprised someone would publish it in the first place. Uh, that was the biggest surprise. And, and I was really thrilled to be able to, to put these ideas down on paper and put them out in a, in a way that I could uh, share them more substantially with people. The reaction to the book has been remarkable. The New York Times bestseller le list is still a long way off, uh, but it spent, it spent all summer on the McNally Robinson bestseller list in Saskatoon and selling great at Turning the Tide. And uh, I've been lucky enough to be invited to give launches in Edmonton and Calgary and New York and Newfoundland. Uh, so we're getting some, and, and I've already done launches in Toronto and Ottawa. Pretty much everywhere we've gone, we've had a great crowd. Yorkton during a rider game was not a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very nice dozen people that I got to spend an afternoon with. But 200 people came out in, in Saskatoon. 
probably because the guy who wrote the introduction was there, probably not because of me, but uh, still, uh, we've, we've had just a great response. Uh, the book is, is selling particularly well, but more importantly, I think I'm, I'm seeing echoes of the arguments coming back to me. Uh, there was an editorial not long ago in the Toronto Star where an anti-poverty group from Ottawa uh, said their number one recommendation for the premiers before they met at the Council of the Federation was to read a healthy society and reframe things in terms of social determinants of health. Why is that happening? I think it's uh, maybe um, following somebody's advice who I shouldn't in politics, Ralph Klein. Uh, but who, uh, who always talked about you know, find a parade and get in front of it. I think some of it is just, it's timely. Uh, this is something that people have been talking about in the academic world all the time for the last several years, for the last maybe 20 years. And it's been building and building into greater popularity among folks who are thinking about these issues. But what's been missing is something to leap the gap into the general public, into the media discourse, into the political discourse. And what hopefully, through the stories and through using uh, a book that's so accessible and through being absolutely shameless and plugging it everywhere, uh, John Gormley accused me of, of shamelessly plugging my book, which really made me smile, <laughs> considering what a hawker he is. Um, but uh, I, th I think because of that, uh, it, it may just be reaching reaching an audience that was ready for this message, that the, that concept of the social determinants of health is mature enough and that the stories are compelling enough that it's, uh, it's making the leap across that gap. Why do I think that this has been successful? It is partly because of that last leadership race in, in 2009. This was our campaign theme. The social determinants of health is what I based the whole campaign on. And it was somewhat the response to that campaign where I did pretty well. Um, for, for somebody no one had ever heard of. Uh, and I think that that was largely because that was a theme that people could relate to, that people connected to. And that, that was part of what led me to really compile these stories and, and do this book. And I think it's been part of why there's been a, a market for it. But I, I, I'm hoping that um, these ideas are going to influence that race, but not just that race. Uh, races across the country. I saw an article last night from Australia where there's uh, a, count, a city council candidate whose campaign theme is the, is the social determinants of health very explicitly sort of broken down along those, uh, those key issues and was interested to see that. We want to open it up to questions. Hi, um, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Miley, how, how do we take the theories from your book and get people to vote in uh, put aside the popularity contest that politics seems to have become and uh, vote for people who are, will, uh, will enact policies that are in their best economic and social, um, in, in their best interests, as opposed to vote for the guy who likes to grandstand and, and announce $80 million for a football stadium that, when that money could be spent much better elsewhere. It's tough to compete with flashy. And, uh, and I don't think these ideas really are flashy. You can't, uh, you can't fit them in a really tiny sound bite. It takes, it takes thought and it takes finding that connection to people, whether it's around the framing of how greater inequality improves the health of everyone in a society, or whether it's using the stories of people in our neighborhoods, people in our communities, and using those stories to put faces on these ideas, it doesn't happen in a snap. What gives me some hope is I actually think there's an appetite out there for something a little more substantial than flashing. I think there's an appetite for a, for a politics that the, the mayor of Calgary talked about their campaign as politics in full sentences, where we actually give people credit that the people of Saskatchewan, the people of Canada, are not dumb folks. And I think we actually do need to articulate things a little more clearly and have faith in people that they're going to listen. It won't happen overnight, and it's going to require creativity, and it's going to require Rinse and repeat. You know, this is not something you can do just once or twice. It has to be over and over and relentless. But I think as, 
as those conversations continue to happen, more and more people are drawn into uh, this way of looking at politics, that there's a real opportunity to change how things are done. Uh, earlier you had mentioned a list of things that you said were determinants of health outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, one that I noticed was missing, um, that is passionate, that I am passionate about, is uh, birth, the way that people are born. Um, you didn't mention it. In Saskatchewan right now, we have um, kind of a culture around birth that isn't necessarily uh, woman or family friendly. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak about what you think um, birth and the way we view birth and um, children and postpartum care and maternal care in general, uh, what place that has in a healthy society. It's true, that doesn't actually come up usually in the list of things that have the greatest impact on long-term health outcomes. And I'm not sure that there is any, to be entirely frank, I'm not sure there, there's any clear data that shows if you're born at home or in the hospital uh, by C-section or, or accompanied. Uh, thinking of things along the lines of like um, breastfeeding duration. Sure, stuff sure. Like that is directly linked to birth. Okay. Um, postpartum depression and how that can affect the whole family and outcomes for that child. Absolutely, kind of absolutely, and and there, yeah. So okay, so now I understand you a little bit better. And so those things are important, and uh, and I'm not saying that they're that they don't impact health. All I'm saying is there's a lot of there isn't a lot of data around where and how people are born uh, that on impact of long-term health outcomes. In regards to what you're talking about, maternal nutrition, maternal mental health before and after delivery, huge impacts. Breast milk huge impacts. Early childhood development, being in a, in a healthy supportive home, uh, having actually social programs or, uh, or community programs where kids can leave that healthy supportive home and also be in a healthy supportive environment, getting, uh, getting exposed to uh, early childhood development programs, schooling, all of these things are extremely important. The earlier that we can be having positive impacts on people's health, on people's understandings of the world around them. The, the evidence is very clear. Their long-term health outcomes are far better. How, how does the arts fit into the healthy society in this framework? <laughs> the arts, where does the arts fit in? Um, I guess you could put it in in a number of places. You could put it in in terms of social supports and the sort of community in the arts and how people relate to one another. Uh, Bernadette is a, is a poet and a writer herself and, and uh, writes some great work. You could put it in education and the way we actually frame our understanding of the world through literature, through art. You could put it in economy. How much does arts impact actually the, I've got, uh, Steve here, who was telling me on the way in about the challenges for him in the film industry since the, the cut to the film industry tax credit, uh, which is a, a great example of a way in which uh, we can actually use the arts to increase health through impacting the economy. The art, art in and of itself, participation in the creation of art and participation in the appreciation of art hasn't tended to be listed among the social determinants of health. It doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact, and I, I think there is a fair amount of evidence that that sort of activity does impact people's mental well-being and physical well-being. It probably ha doesn't tend to rank up there with whether or not you have a safe place to live, whether or not you have access to clean water and clean food, just in terms of gross numbers. But that's sort of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, the, the very basics that you need to get by up to self-actualization. And, and art has a very important role to play in well, making life worthwhile. So uh, that, that's maybe going beyond the basics of, the base of just f physical health and lack of illness to that full mental, physical, and social well-being. A lot of intelligent people in the world think that exploration of private options will solve some of the challenges we face in our healthcare system. I was wondering how you respond to those ideas. Yeah, um, I've been working with Canadian doctors for Medicare for the last several years. And uh, we're an organization that our tagline is uh, values-driven, evidence-based. And I think 
both of those are really important to consider when answering that question. Because one, it, de it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, if you're trying to achieve certain process outcomes, really quick access to some services uh, for certain individuals, if you're trying to achieve complete and utter freedom of choice within the health system, if you're trying to achieve profits for insurance companies or, or large health-oriented corporations, then there's lot, lots of evidence that privatization would achieve those goals. There's not much evidence that it would achieve other goals, like good quality care for everyone, uh, like a more sustainable health system, like faster access to the care that people need. In fact, the evidence points in, a, points in another direction. When you have a single payer publicly funded system, you're able to keep administrative costs low. You're able to deliver care to people based on need and not based on ability to pay. And as a result, you're actually able to uh, provide quality accessible care more cheaply. Now that certainly doesn't mean that there aren't problems within our publicly funded system, there are. It's just that sometimes people, I, I think, exploit those problems to suggest a response to them that would do nothing to solve them. A, a very simple example is cataract surgery in Manitoba. This is now 10 years ago, but it was privatized, or private cataract surgery was introduced. The idea being that'll reduce wait times because you'll take people out of the wait list for the public system and they'll get their cataracts faster because those other people are taken out. What people don't think about is it also takes out ophthalmologists and nurses and uh, other people who work in operating rooms. It doesn't you know, suddenly double your capacity. And as a result, what happened was, if you got a cataract done in the private system, you got it done very fast and very well. If you were getting one done in the public system, the wait list actually doubled and, and, even, and even tripled in cases. So you were seeing great increases in, in weights in the public system and ultimately uh, not delivering the best care. So I think it's really important to, to one, think about the evidence, so actually look at what's been done other places and what works and what doesn't, but also think about the values. What is it we're trying to achieve when we're looking at that evidence? Good question. Is that one of those cases where you mentioned earlier, perhaps just looking a bit more closely, did it, was it, did it go wrong completely or was there just not enough administrative controls to say, Maybe it could be done, but with better oversight of just how much moves to the private sector? The decision in Manitoba was to revoke that completely, and they returned entirely to, uh, to doing cataracts within the public system, and the outcomes and wait lists have actually gone back to a much more acceptable, uh, acceptable level. Not, and I don't think it's, it's never possible, but I think it has to be done in the context of what who's doing it and why and, and exactly how. One of the things that really, and, and in Sweden and other countries that, are, that do have good universal healthcare systems, there have been different attempts to introduce privatization. Sometimes they've continued, sometimes they've stepped back. One of the things to consider is the impact on physician choice as well, whether if, if you're, some countries will say you're allowed to work in the private system so many hours a week, but you still have to work in the public system so many hours a week doesn't end up working very well uh, because just the, the income is better in the private system and people end up finding all kinds of ways to uh, cut short what they do in the, in the public and, uh, and spend more time at their private surgeries. I think the other element is around uh, sort of citizen commitment to the system. The more that you stoke the fires of dissatisfaction with the public system, the more you owe, the more you offer pay options for people to jump out of the system, the less and less you have all Canadians, and in particular, the most influential Canadians, unfortunately, those with lots of money, the less commitment they have to a public system. So it's, it's really, you have to think about the impact of this on all kinds of levels. I'm trying to just reflect on how to frame my thoughts here, and I haven't read your book, and I will very soon. I'll also share it with my daughter, who's a nurse in the health system. Um, what I'm concerned about is you getting yourself framed just in the health sector. In the sense, what I'm saying politically is 
What do we mean by, for example, a healthy economy? Uh, we're living in a world of placeless powers and powerless places. Uh, and we, Saskatchewan is in the middle of this in North America. I mean, they're saying we're now going to have uh, the fastest economic, highest economic uh, growth as a province in the country for ahead of Alberta very soon. We're in the kind of crosshairs of this, whether we realize it or not. Uh, we're selling off our energy resources. Uh, meanwhile, we have no energy policy in Canada. So what, uh, what I'm trying to say is, in terms of taking this theme of health in, in a kind of a social, economic, cultural reality, uh, if, if you want to continue in the political sphere, is how do, we, how, do you, how do you see that emerging? And how are you going to articulate that? Chapter three, when you do get the book, uh, it's all about, is all about the economy. And it's all about, one, the importance of the economy and the income on, uh, on health outcomes, but also talking about how we view, how we measure our success as a society, because we've tended to measure it through economic growth, through GDP. And there are alternative ways of doing that, and alternative ways of doing that that are actually more aligned with actually creating a healthy society. For example, the Canadian Index of Well-Being is one, is one idea that I would really encourage people to look into. What they've done is sort of created a numerical value for the advance in societal well-being overall in a bunch of different areas. Uh, health outcomes, democratic engagement, environmental safety, etc. And what they discovered was that while GDP, GDP has grown in Canada over the last few decades, uh, 30 some percent, well-being has really only grown by about a third of that. And that really gives us pause to reflect on just how well are we using our economic advances to advance our own well-being. Uh, certainly that that shift allows us to examine some of the things like resource revenues and, and the approach that we have to resource extraction, the impact of particular economic policies on social policy. For example, uh, we're, we're in the crosshairs right now, as you say, in Saskatchewan around the fight against working people. The labor review that's underway is a test case it's, it's bad for Saskatchewan workers, but it's bad for people across the country and the, and the continent as workers' rights are really trying to be rolled back. And that's all about a narrow vision of the economy, a narrow vision of success that doesn't include us. And we are also seeing you know, the, impacts on the impacts on the larger environment is another really important element to consider when we're, when we're looking at the choices that we make economically. So it's still important to have a strong economy. It's still important to have a means to employ people, a means to progress. It's just that we have to look at that progress through a lens of our well-being, not just a lens of uh, gross uh, profits. Lastly, I would say keep it to the stories too. Like I really think people have to hear experiences, not some academic study, you know, extensive graphs, all that crap but real, true human stories of what the person's experience has been. You've done it in the health system. I think we need to hear that more in other locales, that sense of what people are experiencing in terms of inequities, injustice, those sorts of things. And I think that's a really important approach for uh, parties that have tended to focus on ideas. Sometimes we get outpaced by people who focus on emotion. And really there is an approach that needs to be taken where we, where we narrate the evidence. We still need the ideas, but we can't count on only the evidence, only the facts, because we need to touch people's hearts as well. It, we have to be balancing that out. And uh, I think that the stories can be an important part of doing that. In your book, in a few places, you talk about um, a low income or a lack of income causing a particular health problem. Um, and, uh, but it's a bit of a chicken and egg argument. And I'm certainly, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, with people on the other side of the political spectrum saying it isn't income causing the problem, it's in the lack of income or low income is actually a symptom. 
um, uh, you know, of some choice or some behavior or some other uh, characteristic. I'm just curious what, what your response to that would be. Uh, one of the ways to try and understand how income impacts health, uh, you know, there's, there's the simple ability to afford the, the bare necessities, uh, but there's also access to education, access to, uh, access to good housing. The, the freedom to try different things, right? You're not always just barely scraping by. You're actually allowed to explore and investigate opportunities in your life. And income is often referred to as the determinant of the determinants. It's, the, it's what really underlies everything else. That choice question is interesting because in cases there is truth to it. There are individuals out there who had every advantage and make bad choices and make a mess of their lives. I don't think that's the majority of the people that you'll find under the low income cutoff. However, I think that's a rare thing. And I think far more often you see people winding up in poverty because they started in poverty. And there are systemic and societal factors that help keep cer certain groups in poverty. That, that reduce the mobility. And as we, as we increase the inequality in our society, the other thing that we do is we decrease the ability for people to actually rise up and, and change their social status. And certainly the, the people that I work with, I think, I think of the patients who come into my clinic who have grown up in an ethnic group that is ostracized in our society. They've grown up in poverty. They've experienced sexual and physical abuse from a young age. They have not been able to complete an education. And they live in poverty now. But in what way is that their choice? You know, what, what choice do they really have? And, and really what I think we need to be looking at is how do we put choice in front of people? How do we actually make it possible for people cho to choose to get out of poverty? Rather than blaming them, how do, we, how do we change that to offering them the chance? Well, it looks like we could wrap up there. One last question. Yes, ma'am. Any thoughts on how we move um, the upstream thinking um, and upstream approaches to be as important as dealing with the crises? Um, it's great to be able to uh, count the widgets on how many of these, how many of those we've done, but how do you get people to start thinking about um, the uh, proving the non-case? We did this and that didn't occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we really do need a, a shift in how we make decisions politically, and part of that goes to spending money first rather than later. And that's a really hard thing for governments to do. They're really good at reacting to a crisis. They're really bad at saying, we're going we're gonna to spend money now to avoid a problem later. It's like we expect them to uh, eat at restaurants and never buy groceries. You know, It's always it's spending more after the fact rather than planning in advance. And that's, a, that's an important discussion that we need to have. That's not how any of us would run our economies at home. That's not, that's not how any of us would uh, advise our neighbors to live, but that's what we seem to expect of governments, that they, rather than invest in early childhood education, that they build a uh, children's hospital. Yeah. That's, that seems to be putting our, putting our attention at the wrong end. It's hard for them to do that, but I think we as citizens need to demand that approach and need to actually force that language and say, why are you spending after the fact? Why aren't you investing in the, the basics that we need to avoid crises down the line? The analogy to health, getting out and exercising and eating well, rather than uh, getting a stent for your heart attack makes, uh, is pretty compelling in that case as well. Thank you for your questions. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. I really appreciate the crowd. I'd like to thank Amber and the Regina Public Library and our co-sponsor Reach who uh, has a good food box and other uh, program display that they'd like you to come and check out. I'll be hanging out at the back signing books if anybody wants to pick up a copy or just chat. Thanks so much.